uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us um, for um, today's lunchtime conversation, Communities of Practice, Bridging Academia and the Creative um, Industries. Um, I'm Tim Cole and I'm one of the um, co-investigators on um, the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D um, programme. Many of you will know something of that, hopefully, um, but for those who aren't so sure, perhaps I can just give you a brief introduction um, to the program um, before saying a bit more about today's conversation. Bristol and Bath um, Creative R&D is a collaboration between um, four universities in the region. Uh, so uh, UE, Bristol, uh, University of Bristol, Bath Spa and University of Bath and also the Digital Creative Centre Watershed. Um, the program connects the worlds of university research and creative business to develop a shared vision for um, tomorrow's creative industries. A core part of the program is a series of pathfinders, which are themed R&D projects um, that are aimed to lead the Bristol and Bath cluster into the future um, to engage with emerging technologies and to develop a diverse talent base. There's five pathfinders running um, through the four years or five years of the program from 2019 through to 2022, 23. First one, digital placemaking, which just showcased recently um, currently expanded performance, uh, amplified publishing just kicking off and um, Kate Pullinger who's joining us today is leading on that and so we'll say a little bit more about that right at the end I think in a, uh, the next conversation. And then the forthcoming Creative Ecologies Pathfinder and one that's just in development that I'll be part of which is looking at internationalizing um, the cluster hopefully working between Bristol Bath and Lagos in Nigeria. Um, our events program um, allows us an opportunity to share work in progress, conversations, um, thoughts and ideas. Um, and you can sign up for future talks at uh, Bristol and Bath, um, sorry, bristolbathcreative.org. So bristolbathcreative.org, which we can maybe throw into the chat, is the website where you can sign up um, to everything. The talk has got an option for live captioning. Um, it's just in the bottom box. Um, you'll see um, a, a box that says CC live transcript. So just click on that and then you'll be able to access um, live transcript. Um, what you'll also find at the bottom um, is a Q&A function that we'll be using um, to um, field questions. What we'll do is have an initial discussion and then we'll open up for um, questions. So please um, just pop questions into Q&A as, um, as they come up. So just as, as people are talking about ideas, as they come up, just pop them into the Q&A function. Um, don't use the chat, um, but try and use the Q&A function um, for that. And then we'll access all of the questions um, through that. Um, and we'll, um, we'll bring those to um, our um, conversationalist this afternoon um, who I'd, I'd love to just try and ask to introduce themselves and maybe we could do this by um, by asking you to introduce yourself uh, perhaps through a bit of work that you've done um, so maybe it's a piece of work that's ongoing or, or, or kind of recent um, that would maybe help us um, to get a sense of who you are where you're coming from and in particular perhaps through work that brings together academics as well as creatives um, so maybe Angie could I start with you um, just because um, your uh, surname comes first um, in the alphabet um, for no other reason but maybe Angie if you could just say a little bit about yourself perhaps by introducing yourself through some work yeah hi I'm Angie I run a company called Trigger who are based in Bristol um, two pieces of work that I can tell you a bit about. One is um, called The Hatchling, and uh, you can see more about it on our website, thehatchling.co.uk. And it, it's a puppet dragon that will hatch in the middle of Plymouth city centre um, this summer. Um, it's the size of a single decker bus when she's a baby, and then she roams the city. She nests um, next to the city hall. She creates a city-wide debate about what are we gonna do about this dragon. Um, the next day she's grown, she's the size of a double-decker bus and she makes her way to the hoe, which are the cliff tops of Plymouth. And then she unfurls her 20 meter wingspan um, and then she'll fly from the cliff tops. So we're creating the world's um, biggest flying puppet and the first puppet to be non-mechanical so she doesn't have a car um, or a crane underneath her like um, large-scale puppets usually do. 
And we've been working with Brigstow. We've got five uh, research projects connected to the dragon. We're interested in where the dragons come from, because dragons have been found in every ancient culture in the world, which is why I'm interested in um, using that icon. In the East, you would never kill a dragon. It's respected, um, it's powerful. And in the West, we automatically go to kill it. It's a monster and it's greedy. So we're playing with um, both of those things. We developed the framework of her with a paleontologist. So um, he was quite interested in, well, he, he had a, a bugbear about the Game of Thrones dragon and said, the Game of Thrones dragon could never fly. Its tail's too thick, it's too heavy. If you look at migrating birds, we know that um, you know, this is the amount they need to eat and be able to create, um, make long distances. So we looked at all sorts of flying creatures. And so our dragon, if she was alive, could fly. Um, we've also been looking at uh, the City Hall debate, which initially was going to be a live theatrical event, um, and now we're looking at digital democracy tools. Um, so how can we use... Um, so another thing is that I'm a Bristol uh, creative fellow for um, the Bristol City um, Fellowships, I think it's called, with the uh, City Council and... Um, Bristol University and there I've been developing um, my knowledge around citizen democracy and thinking about how we can use those tools to create a live conversation in the city about what are we going to do about the dragon and then after she's flown potentially pose the question now that the dragon has flown what next so I'll leave it there but that's what I'm currently embroiled in Brilliant. Thanks so much, Andy. That's great. Um, maybe, Emma, let's move on, on to you, just because um, C comes after B in the alphabet. Um, so, um, Emma, do you want to introduce yourself just maybe through a project to get a kind of current project? Yeah, of course. Uh, so, thanks, Tim. My name is Emma Cole, and I'm a senior lecturer in liberal arts and classics at the University of Bristol. Um, and my creative um, collaborations tend to primarily take place in the theatre industry. And so I'll follow Angie's lead and introduce two of my projects. Uh, the first one is with Punch Drunk Theatre Company, who are long-standing collaborators of mine. And we're currently working on a project which is funded through an AHRC Innovation Fellowship. And the, the first output of that um, finished in 2017, um, which was a production or kind of an R&D exercise actually called Cabayroy. And we're trying to now scale up what we were doing there and explore um, the potential of the format we did there in a different, uh, a bigger scale version. Um, and Cabayroy was a production which took place on the streets of London. It lasted for six to seven hours and it used three fragments of a lost Greek tragedy as its source text. Um, so we were really trying to think about the potential for uh, non-linear narrative, um, narratives which we don't, we, we're not able to fill in the gaps for and what potential there might be to explore different potentialities for that. Um, and also non-standard forms of immersivity as well. So the company um, had developed a reputation for a particular type of immersive performance and they were trying to do something quite different um, with this project by using a non-familiar source text where people wouldn't know what the narrative was and indeed we couldn't even find out what the narrative was if we wanted to uh, because we know literally nothing about this play the fragments don't really tell us anything about the narrative so all we can do is hypothesize about how it might have fit into different mythological strands. Um, the second project is kind of the flip side of Cabero. So Cabero was all about working with absence of narrative um, the other project that I'll introduce you to is a trilogy of tragedies, which is called Medea in Exile, that I've been developing with an Australian playwright called Tom Holloway. Um, and this project started in 2018. We had a staged reading in Bristol then. Um, we had one in New York last year, and it's now going through some further development. And this trilogy um, looks at the figure of Medea, probably one of the most well-known tragic heroines from the ancient world. Um, but it tries to reshape our understanding about Medea um, because Euripides Medea is probably the most famous Greek tragedy, um, the most commonly staged one or one of the most commonly staged ones. But actually there were 32 tragedies about Medea in the ancient world. And so we've used fragments from those other tragedies also visual sources from the ancient world. Um, for example, there's a, a vase that we have from antiquity, which has Medea, who famously killed her children on one side, and Heracles on the other, who also killed his children. 
And so we've used that vase as kind of um, an invitation to explore what would happen if these two figures met in the ancient world. Um, so we're very much working with narrative here and trying to explore some alternative narratives to the one that's become very familiar to audiences here um, and to try and explore the kind of plurality of mythologies that ancient audiences might have been familiar with. So there's two projects that I'm engaging with at the moment. Great. Gosh, it's like, um, Kate, this is amazing, isn't it? Like, how do you follow that? Um, so we've got dragons and um, citizen democracy and nonlinear narratives and kind of multiple tragedies. Um, Kate, could you say a little bit maybe about yourself or just introduce yourself perhaps through some of the recent work that you've done? So some of, of your own practice. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, wonderful. Um, well, I'm Kate Pullinger. Um, I'm Professor of Creative Writing and Digital Media at, at Baspa University. And I, um, along with Tim, am one of the academics who works on the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D Partnership. Um, but I, my, I'm, a, I'm a writer primarily. I write fiction. Um, and uh, sort of the first, first half of my working life, I was a freelance writer uh, writing novels and uh, short stories. Uh, then uh, around about 20 years ago, I also started working with digital media to create kind of participatory, uh, digitally mediated new forms of storytelling. Uh, and I, I did that also as part of my kind of freelance, freelance portfolio. But then um, a, a, a bit over a decade, really, after having some kind of peripheral engagement with universities, mainly through you know, bits of sessional lecturing and that kind of thing, I, um, I took the plunge and, and, um, and went for an academic job and, and, um, and you know, have, have, have been kind of more firmly embedded in academia since then, whilst kind of maintaining my, uh, my own uh, creative practice alongside that. And of course, in, a, in an academic context, my creative practice is my, is my research. That's, that's what I do, I write. Um, so I, I thought I'd... Um, I thought I'd talk about two, two projects here. Um, the first is a project from a couple of years ago called Ambient Literature, which was um, a, a project that was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, where we, um, we looked at new forms of um, situated storytelling, location-based, um, audio, uh, text-based, et cetera, storytelling. Um, and that project, that, that was, it was a terrific project, that pro project, and one of the reasons was that it had it had three writers uh, at its heart who were doing the business of, of re as they say in Canada, research creation. Uh, inst you know, instead of the, the slightly confusing term practice-based research, uh, in Canada they call it research creation. So we had, uh, and I was one of those three writers, uh, which was great for me because it was great to come into a an academic research pro project as, as a practitioner. Um, and in that project, I, I created a, um, a ghost story uh, for, the, for the smartphone called Breathe. Uh, and we had a big team working on, on the project. It was a collaboration with um, Google Creative Labs in Sydney, as well as um, Visual Editions, who are based in London. And then the kind of academic researchers who were part of the ambient literature project who were looking at ambient literature in terms of audience response um, and the, the whole the whole kind of business about producing new forms of literature so that's that ghost story you can you can read it on your phone now if you if you it, it's web-based it's it's to be read on your smartphone but it's uh, you don't have to download anything it's based in the browser and it uses apis application processing interfaces to personalize the story to every reader so it it, it allows you it it draws in your location the weather where you are and also the time where you are and the text changes uh, according to those APIs, and then it also uses some of the other affordances of the phone, you know, to do with um, how you touch the phone, et, et cetera, to, to tell its story. Uh, and so for me, it was a really rewarding project because of the way in which it brought together academic researchers across various fields alongside um, practitioners and, and, and writers. Um, 
and I also, Tim, I, I've thought a bit about the problems that those kinds of pro projects also create that I'm sure we, we can talk about talk about later. And then just the second project, uh, which is just about to, to get going next week, actually, is our our third big project in the Bristol Bath Creative R&D program, Amplified Publishing. Uh, and again, this is this is a project that tries to bring to, it's we're, we're going to be taking it uh, hopefully a really deep dive for the next four months into thinking about what the future of publishing is across across many sectors so including games music books magazine as well as online video etc et so a really broad look at publishing and trying to think about what the future the future of content creation might be and we have a cohort of um i think it's yeah we have a co cohort of 18 fellows and partners and those those people range from individual practitioners to um to small uh, small businesses that are located in the region, to some really big um, industry partners who are, are who are global. Um, I think they posted posted a link to it now. If you if you're interested in taking a look at that, and um, again, I think having the process of having academics and practitioners in the room together really will produce hopefully some really interesting research and inter interesting interesting new ways of thinking. Great. Maybe um, I could start with the next question um, with you, Kate, just kind of following on from that. And then I'll go to kind of Angie and Emma. Um, you, you're interesting, Kate, because you've got this kind of hybrid um, role as a creative practitioner and an academic. Um, and I really like your um, use of that phrase, research creation, as opposed to kind of practice based research, which, you know, you're right, we use much more in the UK context, I think, don't we? We talk a lot more about practice based research. Could you I don't know, is it possible for you to pass out those separate parts of your being or, or is it all kind of um, merged together? What what does Kate the academic look like and what does Kate the creative practitioner look like? Or is is Kate actually about the fusion of those two things? How have you thought about that? sort of <laughs> Like a sort of monster, a hybrid monster. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that, yeah, there's only one Kate Pullinger. Um, but there, but there is there is tension there, uh, especially as I've uh, you know now that I'm a professor and I direct a research center. There's tension over over time. You know, I mean, I I think that's true of, of everyone. But it, in in terms of um, you know trying to trying to lead a research center at the same time as as uh, developing my own creative pra practice. So lot, lots of tensions around that. But I think also I. Um, I took some decisions early on about what I wouldn't do uh, or, or what I wouldn't attempt to do, which is that I, I've never, um, I, I'm, I'm not somebody who, who writes in a scholarly way. I don't write academic research papers. And I, I just, I, I did do a, I did do a practice based PhD and I was so sort of traumatized by that experience. It enabled me to, to say, okay, I don't, I'm not going to write about, uh, I'm not going to try to be a scholar as well as a, as well as a, a practitioner. And I think, I think making that decision helped me, uh, helped me move forward and helped me. I mean, we all, we're all, um, well, most of us, uh, you know, experience imposter syndrome. Uh, but I think if I'd attempted to become a scholarly academic writer, as well as a creative writer, I would have, um, the, the imposter syndrome would have overwhelmed me and made me run away. So um, I think, you know, I think uh, having some clarity around uh, what what you want to do, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of a larger picture. Um, and, and luckily, the, the university that I work for, Bath Spa, is jammed to the rafters with creative practitioners uh, because of the nature of the kind of university it is. And, and so I don't have to fight battles over defining creative work as research because so many of my colleagues, that is what they do. And, and I know that that's not always the case in, in universities. Maybe that's a kind of natural point to move on to Emma, because in a sense, you're in a university that's crammed to the rafters with other types of researchers. And I wondered about your own sense of identity, Emma, as a classicist um, who, you know, I know does write as a, a scholar, like, um, you know, the kind of normal scholarly apparatus of a kind of classicist, but you're also involved in these really interesting projects. 
what's your own sense of kind of I suppose where you where yours what skill set you bring to these projects and where where you draw the boundaries and what you see others doing um, within these projects say punch drunk um, you know as the kind of most recent collaborators yeah so I think um, when Kate used the word tension that very aptly sums up my own experiences as well here um, you're exactly right Tim that I'm in um, a department where I think, not just the department really, the school, the faculty, there, there are definitely um, not so many people engaging in this type of creative practice. And a, a real battle that I face, particularly at the moment with Punch Drunk, is um, part of engaging in creative collaboration is valuing process over product. Um, and this has never been more true than in the current climate where there's been um, delays in the creative industries much more than in other industries, I would say. Um, whereas in an academic environment, the product is the thing that's valued. We want to see an output from a period of research leave, for example. Um, and trying to fit work which sometimes the, the learning and the knowledge is in the process rather than in the resulting output is quite challenging. And it does mean um, sometimes trying to get my creative work with Punch Drunk to fit into an academic format as well. Um, so that's a, a real battle that I've had at the moment. So for example, the, the current project um, that I've got with Punch Drunk, um, building on from Kibayroi, is supposed to result in a monograph which contains a rehearsal study in it um, and also a creative output and the creative output got delayed because of covid and so the monograph then can't be written because there's no rehearsals to study um, so that puts me in a difficult position um, characterized by the word tension i suppose and there are things you can do to navigate that um, you know funders have things like no cost extensions and whatnot but it's definitely an environment where the, um, the objectives are perhaps slightly different for myself as opposed to my collaborators. Um, and so I am very aware of the fact that I'm, I'm speaking to different priorities and um, I'm being assessed by people who have different checks and balances that they're looking for. And so it is difficult. Um, it does mean, um, I suppose, pivot has become a very fashionable word of late. And it does mean that I've had to kind of pivot some of my aims and objectives when I'm wearing my research hat and to carve out different types of publications than maybe what I might have envisaged originally because the creative one might not go to plan. Um, so it um, teaches me some skills about of flexibility and whatnot, which are valuable in any climate and in any workspace, um, but it's definitely challenges that are not shared, I think, by everyone in my department and in my immediate professional surrounds at Bristol. Um, maybe, Angie, we could leave on to you. I, I think what's your, so in a sense, you kind of um, are operating in a, in a slightly different context than Kate and Emma, because you're not um, embedded within a university, you've a Borough University of Bristol, you're embedded in a different kind of community of practice. And I wonder what your sense of your context is um is it weird that you work um quite extensively with, with academics is that seen as odds within the world you occupy or is that seen as increasingly normal and i guess what do you feel like you bring to them and what do you think they bring to you um the academic researchers that you you've been working with yeah i mean i've been drawn um all of my professional career to work with academics because i like to jump into different specialisms you know, with the hatchling, be that kite flying or, um, and, and wherever I work, I need expertise in that particular area because I'm sort of f fluttering around. <laughs> One minute I'll be interested in puppets, the next minute we're, we're doing work in hospitals right now in ICU units and I have to um, work with people who really know what they're doing. And then um, at the moment we're now working in horticulture and gardening and that's a whole new field. Um, so what do we bring to each other? Well, I think academics and artists both um, have exploratory processes. We're both really interested in very niche ideas. And it's always interesting working with academics because they're like, wow, you're interested in that. That's what you do every day is working on this dragon flying. Um, whereas I'll look at an academic and say, wow, that's really niche. I can't believe you write papers on that very particular subject. Um, so yeah, there's a really nice uh, opportunity there for, the, for those to spark off each other. Um, the other thing is like about what do we bring to each other? 
as an artist, I've got a desire to bring out open and healthy conversations about, for me, topics around race, immigration, multiculturalism, um, and to also think about how we can get people to be invested and literally participate in the work that we're doing. Um, and people who are usually not interested in or, or wouldn't usually buy a theatre ticket. That's my personal motivation. Um, so that offer to academics is quite exciting because when you're working, I mean, I spoke to one uh, expert in citizen democracy last week and he said, the thing is, it's really boring, but if we're getting people to talk about a dragon and use these tools and learn how to use them, then it becomes interesting. And then that might have some uh, retention for people in, in Plymouth and that might be able to be used um, into the future and, uh, for people to to uh, warm up using those techniques. So in, maybe just following on from that, in a sense, I guess you're really interested in it, Angie, in audiences, that audiences matter to you, and, and you have a very particular view of audiences as well, that they're very diverse and also participatory, that there's a sense of them as far from passive. Do you feel like the academics you work with are, le are less hazy, are kind of more hazy on that? Like how far does the academy, do you feel like, grapple with audiences in the way that say you do you know within the kind of industry that you're part of hmm. well there's um there's good academics and bad academics when it comes to artistic collaboration and i think the good ones are the ones who offer um offer their expertise um are really interested in what you want to do take a creative journey with you but don't um, take the place where they're going to decide what the artwork is and therefore how it should take shape um, and they they do you know you respect each other's expertise um, and it's great to come into a room and brainstorm but um, sometimes you're like don't it's fine just tell me everything you know <laughs> and then we'll brainstorm so I think it's when people can tool you up um, and and also that there's a good artist in that and the good artist is like you know humble and says this is a new area for me and I don't know everything and can you tell me it from plain simple English and then um, as I develop um, my questions around it we will open things out. I mean that starts bringing us on to a set of questions about how we work well together because in a sense I think it's really nice Auntie, that you've you talked about those good academics and bad academics to work with. Um, and, and maybe, Kate, you started to hint at that a little bit about the kind of sense that there are some tensions sometimes between the academy and the creative industries. Um, can you talk us through maybe some of the, the points where you've seen that in your own experience, you know, maybe the last 10 or 20 years of kind of working in that space? Like, where, where, where are those, some of those tension points? And I think Andy's almost hinted at one there where it's almost like a kind of um, an academic who doesn't know where to stop who kind of wants to grab hold of the kind of artistic um, work um, uh, and a kind of lack of, I suppose, a lack of respect of expertise, um, you know, in the mutual way. Are there other things that you've seen in your own experience, Kate, where there's these kinds of, of tensions that emerge? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess three, three areas really. One is um, business you know, in, in terms of uh, either either um, selling books or selling tickets or, you know, that, that, that the, 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 you know, the, the drive to find your audience might be something that, uh, that academics that I've worked with uh, find rather mysterious and aren't so much interested in because they don't have to be. And that, I guess that also um, is related to the, to the next point, which is about, um, equity in teams where some of the team is in a salaried position uh, in, a, in an institution and other other people are are freelancers uh, and and how um, sometimes um, academics can assume that people are being paid for what they're doing when in fact they're not uh, we had those kinds of tensions in previous projects that I've, I've been engaged with and I think that's that's something that that sometimes gets forgotten and then is is um you know has to <laughs> the university has to be forcefully reminded and we all know also how bad universities are at um at dealing with pay, paying freelancers that's a whole other rabbit hole that we we could go down and but probably shouldn't <laughs> um and then lastly i think um this is a 
um, kind of a minor point, but also sort of emblematic in some ways. It, it is around jargon and, and use of jargon, whether it's academic jargon or um, jargon that comes from the, high, the higher education. I mean, universities are the most jargon laden, laden places I have ever, you know, ever encountered. And um, I think that for people who don't reside within that, it, it, that can be really off-putting and, um, and, and, and a kind of a, a, a barrier. I mean, I, I will admit that when I was interviewed for my current position, I, I, I went through the whole interview where a piece of jargon was used repeatedly and I had no idea what it was, but I just pretended and <laughs> I pretended I knew what it was. And luckily I, I, I luckily I got through that, but, um, so yeah, so kind of three inter interrelated things really. Um, Emma, maybe we can turn to you to to see if there's anything else that's emerged from your own practice and experience around some of those tensions. And then what would be nice is to explore some kind of solutions, I guess, or to think about what we see as best practice. But before we get to that, are there any tensions that you feel like crop up? And you've already mentioned one around timescales and process products, so kind of different set of expectations. Are there other things that have emerged because of that sense of the different context in which um, you're operating from, say, a theatre company? Because there's definitely um, a, a different tension um, from the academics standpoint. And, you know, Angie mentioned good academic collaborators and bad academic collaborators. Um, and I wouldn't say that there are, are, are bad theatrical collaborators and good ones, but there's definitely, um, I suppose, a divide between what different artists are looking for out of um, an academic. And I suppose it's not necessarily two types of collaboration, but um, there's a sense, particularly with working with the ancient world and with um, texts from ancient Greece or ancient Rome, um, some artists will want an academic advisor rather than a collaborator. So someone that they can just speak to for an hour, half a day even, and get answers, um, definitive responses to what this means, what evidence there is for this, what the accurate or authentic way of representing the other thing is. Um, I guess it's the equivalent of what does a, a dragon look like that could fly. Um, and then there are other artistic collaborators um, who are much more interested in engaging in kind of a dialogic collaboration. Um, and for me personally, I'd much rather join a project where it is going to be that kind of dialogic format. Um, and the way that we developed um, the Punch Drunk collaboration involves me going on secondment to the company for extended periods of time, um, because they ask questions of ancient texts and respond in a very different way to the way that academics do. And I learn a lot from their creative insights. Um, and although what they project or imagine might not stand up to kind of academic scrutiny in a peer-reviewed fashion, they can spark ideas and new ways of looking at texts for me. So I really value the opportunity to be around for those types of discussions. Um, and I wouldn't dream of trying to intervene into creative decisions, but even just to be on a, a fly on the wall in those types of conversations can really spark things for me. Um, and so there definitely is that tension when someone gets in contact with you and you're not quite sure about what type of a future they envisage in terms of your involvement in the project and trying to navigate that. And that takes a lot of time and that goes back to that earlier tension of, of timescales, you know, to, to find the right type of partnership for an artistic collaboration is not a, a quick process. Um, it's not something that you can necessarily turn around um, during one 12 week period of research leave, it can take years to find the right way of working with a particular collaborator. Um, that's really helpful, I think, that idea of a kind of difference between almost like a transactional relationship and a sort of dialogical collaboration. Um, and the kind of academic as a, a one hour um, expertise versus a kind of more dialogic collaboration. I guess, Angie, maybe on your side, do you feel like the same happens? Can you see the same distinction within the, the work that you've done? Are there times when it feels like what academics want from you is a transactional relationship and other times when they want a dialogical um, collaboration? Does this kind of go both ways, do you think? Yeah, I think um, I've been really uh, perhaps lucky, but perhaps all, all academics are like this, but really generous um, open collaborations where people really take the time. Um, we've had one particular 
uh, academic working with us, Mel Pratchett, who is a taxidermist and zoologist, and she's been following the whole process of the dragon and spends really long periods of time in rehearsals and then we'll have chats with the director and um, even, you know, and, and talk about different animals and you can just see his brain firing off and then he'll go straight directly back into the host, um, rehearsal room and sometimes try things out that he wasn't going to do before. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's usually, when you, when you spend the time, you can get something out of it and it's, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, the ones that you don't have an open, um, you have an open approach and you don't decide before the process starts exactly what you're going to end up with and, 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 and you both allow that time to, to just let it flow out um, and nobody's tapping at your door at the end of the day saying, well, where's my X, Y and Z? I'm thinking about another relationship now with James Freeman, who's been developing the City Hall debate with and last year we had to postpone the performance and then he's and got away and then last week I spoke to him after a super long time about these um, citizen democracy tools and we only had uh, 45 minutes but he didn't mind that we completely changed direction and the input that he had into that process was really really rich for me and then he wasn't pushing it trying to meet again but the the doors open for us to to uh, go back so I think keeping those parameters really wide is helpful and not being nervous that you're not creating results and neither party is too nervous that the other one's not getting enough out of it. Trust that you are. That's really um, interesting, I think, to kind of, and I like that idea of sort of these open collaborations. I guess the question um, that that raises is um, maybe a couple of things. One is almost like, well, what's the motivation for those kinds of open collaborative relationships? So what's in it for each partner, do you think? Um, to be involved in those kind of things. And maybe there's also something there about also the kind of pragmatics um, of what can we do to encourage those kinds of relationships? So what, what would enable or facilitate more of those kinds of open, um, collaborative, exploratory relationships? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in with a sense of what they feel like they've got from those more kind of open relationships, um, or, or to, to kind of give a sense of what they feel like we, we need to, to do, say, in our region to facilitate that because we've got we're a region with four great universities with really extraordinarily interesting people and an amazing creative industries um community like what could we do practically in our region to facilitate that angie maybe do you want to go first on that yeah i'm desperate to say something actually because i you know not to over flatter you and gail at brigstow but with brigstow we come in uh, regularly and talk to um you guys and, and talk about the the topics that we're working with and there's a lot of lateral thinking that happens even before we meet an academic about who might really find this interesting so when you first said Mel Pratchett would be really interested to choose a taxidermist I didn't see the link and yet we become drawn to each other and and the same goes for the other academics who are working on this when I approached other universities, not mentioning, you know, not saying any of these, but it, it, that conduit is really difficult to find. The person who has knowledge across um, the academic sector, and um, when I've spoken to some universities, there they don't really understand the artistic um, process and what is in it for the academic and artist. And I think once that role is missing, then academics miss out, and so do artists. And, and is your sense? I mean, I think. Universities are notoriously opaque in some ways, aren't they? I guess as an artist creative, um, and, and Kate, this might be interesting for you to reflect on as well, like how easy are universities to access, like to find, even within our region, you know, to find where expertise lies or where those kind of curious minds, where, you know, how do you find someone like Emma, if you're a, a theatre company who's interested um, in working with fragments of, of ancient texts, how do you, what, what are the ways that um, universities can better enable that kind of serendipitous encounter? Do you have a sense, Angie or Kate, of, of what that would look like? I mean, Angie, you go, you go. Yeah, I was just going to give you my good and bad. The good university who, um, who, who can think uh, quite openly about the sort of pe people you want to work with. And um, the bad approach is that you get a list of academics. And so when you're working on a particular topic, you go to the obvious department so for that it might for us that might have been um anthropology and mythology or something and that that actually our world was opened up by not going to the people we thought 
automatically we might want to need to work with. Okay. Yeah, I think I think often it can also just be on an individual level. Uh, that I mean, certainly my experience as a as a as a novelist is that if you find someone who's really expert in the field that you're trying to learn about, and you approach them and say, "Look, I'm trying to write this novel," you'll often you'll often get a response. Uh, and so you know that those kind of personal connections can can be can be really good. I think I think also one thing that I found really interesting is the way in which universities operate on a different timeline than the rest of the rest of the world uh, and and academic research can be sl really slow and to, I think obviously there are obvious disadvantages of that for 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 artists and practitioners but there are also advantages in that um, you can find somebody who's been working on the same thing for a really long time and really knows what they're talking about and um if they're the if they're the right kind of person will be open to helping you learn about that and that that linked to something angie said earlier as well about um fluttering around and how a kind of creative process is like being being like a magpie and going going for the shiny bits uh, but the academic is the person who's been polishing that shiny bit for a really long time. And so I think that there's, you know, huge value in, 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 in trying to, trying to, um, trying to find the right people. And I, but I also think it's, it is through research centers like yours, Tim, uh, hopefully, um, the, the one that I run and, and also the kind of increasing sense of civic engagement and public facing work that universities feel that they they need to be doing now. Uh, so for uh, practitioners in the region to try to engage with that, to try to learn about what people are doing and who's who's interesting and who might who might be happy to talk to you. Emma, do you want to um, say a little bit about just how how you kind of found Punch Drunk or Punch Drunk found you, how those relationships started? Um, and I guess what um, you feel like have been the kind of the, the productive nature of that that relationship. My, my relationship with Punch Drunk actually goes back, um, I think, to about 2014 or 15, when I was asked to come and spend some time during a series of workshops on a production that was going to be adapted from Sophocles' Ajax at Camden People's Theatre. So it wasn't Punch Drunk. Um, it was a different company, um, a different group of artists, who were working on a show which only had funding for a R&D workshop period. And that show never ended up going anywhere. But then when a couple of years later, they had this idea to work with Tragic Fragments, they remembered how I'd been involved um, because some of the people who had worked on that Ajax show were now working with Punch Drunk. And they remembered my involvement in the Ajax and um, the, the type of conversation and the type of collaboration that I was interested in. And they got in touch with me again at that point. Um, so just like um, Angie said, you know, you'd be open to not necessarily going to the obvious person. Um, and if someone suggests a taxidermist over an anthropologist, um, I think it's the same for academics looking for collaborators. And there can be, I think, a sense um, for a lot of academics who are interested in kind of ideas of impact that you need to collaborate with big hitters. If you want to work with the theatre industry, well, you need to work as an academic advisor on a national theatre production. Um, but actually, if you have a much more open mind about who you might collaborate with and what version of a, a product or what stage of a product you might get involved in. I think it can lead into unexpected places, both for your research and also in terms of the, the type of work that you start engaging with. I mean, I went from advising on a, a show that was um, going to be just a straight adaptation um, of a Greek tragedy to something which was much more innovative in terms of engaging with technology and playable cities and um, scales of very small audiences and very durational length productions. Um, so definitely being open to where something might go has worked out well for me in terms of collaboration. Thanks. Maybe I could um, ask you a little bit about your own kind of personal learning. Um, I'd be really interested in, you know, the kind of relationships that you've um, you've you've um, 
operated in the sort of these kind of more open relationships or these kind of conversations between the academy and creative practice what do you feel like has been your own kind of personal um development i guess and, and specifically in your own practice from kind of adopting either in kate your sense the sort of more hybrid mix or um for angie and emma i guess also a sort of hybridity in in your own practice um what what do you feel like you look like now as a result of all of those kinds of of collaborations is there anything you could pinpoint um maybe kate you first is there anything you'd say kind of that making that move from a, a novelist into a novelist who's op op operating within a university and specifically maybe the ambient literature project has has that how has that shaped or, or changed or impacted your own practice i guess i guess it's quite simple really it's it's the way that the the uh, the university enables me to interact with a lot of really smart people who have really interesting ideas about all kinds of different things and for me that's been that was that was the great pleasure of ambient literature and that's also the great pleasure of the bristol and bath creative r d program um that that um you know just 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 the way in which i get and i guess also it comes that does in both those instances it comes down to to money it comes down to funding that we managed to secure the funding to give us the space to do these to do the talking and thinking together which is where you produce good ideas uh so I'm a, I'm kind of at a at a point which I don't quite know what I'm going to do next in terms of create creative work. I've got some ideas of what I'd like to do, but I know that um, the conversations that I've been participating in for the last four years or so have just really widened my horizons with thinking about technology and and thinking about you know media archaeology and um, you know the whole the whole the whole business of what technology does and doesn't do for us these days. Um, Angie, do you want to offer some reflections on your own kind of sense of some of the projects you've been involved in, like what you feel like um, you've gained from working with others? And in particular, I'd be interested in your own practice, like how has this impacted your own um, practice as a kind of immersive theatre maker, artist, um, audience experience? Yeah, I think because, um, as I said earlier, academics and artists are both ex doing ex exploration, exploratory practices. Um, yet in the arts, and particularly in theatre, we exist in a bubble, we know each other, we see each other's work, we can be guilty of recycling bits of other people's work. As soon as you work with an academic, that sort of bursts your echo chamber open and you can, it can sort of kick you out of uh, cliches and it can kick you out of things that you think you already know. Um, and so the collaborative discussions and even finding out what the academic is exploring in quite a niche way can um, shake the foundations of your project in a really interesting way. So it means that you're, for me, I've learned that, the art, that whatever I, I work on and whatever I work on next, I always want academics and expertise involved it makes it much more artistically rich um, and it creates greater connections to the audience and that's for a couple of reasons one is because academics are interested in audience they're always interested in people it's just sometimes that work doesn't always go directly into the public eye and that's what um artists work can do so yeah and Emma, it'd be interesting to get your sense of your own um, impacts on your own academic career, because I know you're, you're, you're um, you know, you're kind of got this foot in two camps in some ways that you're someone who's teaching within a, a classics department in a sort of traditional university and you're writing um, work within that context. How do you think your practice has been shaped, maybe both as a teacher and as a researcher? Um, through the kinds of collaborations that you've undertaken with um, theatre companies like, say, Punch Drunk? So in terms of as a researcher, it's definitely um, changed the way that I write doing these types of collaborations. And on the one hand, I've realized that there's room for um, listening to practitioner insights and using them to inform more traditional classic scholarship, actually. Um, so by analyzing or, or listening to what artists understand to be um, the meaning behind um, what can be an inexplicable pack passage to classicists or what audiences get out of that. Um, 
I can have fresh ideas about what the, the meaning of something that people have never been able to pinpoint might be. Um, so an example of that, which is not from Punch Drunk, um, but there's, there's a famous um, moment in this play by Sophocles called Trachinii, where Heracles, the hero, starts um, speaking in verse, um, so singing. And um, characters in Greek tragedy generally don't do that. The chorus sings and the characters speak. Um, and people have often um, argued that it makes him effeminate in this moment, but um, some artists that I was working with interpreted that as kind of almost like a post-traumatic stress disorder moment after he'd been going through his labours. And that prompted a new way of me for analysing that particular passage. Um, so I can still do what kind of traditional scholarly analysis that's informed by the practitioner insights. But I've also learned that actually there's room within even a discipline that's quite traditional like classics, there is room for different methodologies and different ways of working. Um, so at the moment for the punch trunk work, I'm experimenting with um, doing what's known as spectator, participa spectator participation as research. Um, so it's a bit like practice as research, but I'm not the practitioner. I'm not saying that I'm the creative artist here. I'm watching and learning and doing my research through that methodology. It's a bit like a kind of ethnographic participant observation type approach. Um, in terms of teaching, I definitely do a lot of reception teaching. So I do teach antiquity through its legacy in the modern world. And I find that that's um, something which is very popular at Bristol. I'm not the only one in the department who does it by any means, um, but a way of making the ancient world come to life, um, making the students realize, you know, we're not studying something that's disconnected from us in the modern world, but actually there are huge um, ranges of ways that we can engage with it in the modern world and an enormous number of people in different sectors who are engaging with it as well. And actually, um, there are real practical applications of what they're doing, even if they're studying a dead language, where they can go off into different sectors. So I think it does um, inform the degree program that we offer here by showing the relevance of what might be thought of as quite a niche subject area. Great, thanks. We'll, we'll turn to um, questions that have been coming in um, and do feel free to kind of add more questions um, to the Q&A. Um, so I'll turn to those in a moment. Maybe I could just ask you one quick fire question before we do that. Um, and one thing I'm really struck by actually is the way that all three of you, I think in a sense, I feel like you, you, um, you, you resist kind of um, a sort of labeling like that you're, I think it feels like all three of you have in common a kind of sense of pushing boundaries of what it is that you do um, in your practice, that you're not kind of willing to be hedged in by a set of like terms, but you're kind of moving in really interesting ways, project by project, um, depending on what the nature of the project is. And so maybe as a kind of quick fire question, I could ask like in a sort of amazing ideal world where you get a million quid um, to enable you to work over the next three to four years, like, is there one thing you would love to do? And is there kind of one person or group of people or sort of set of expertise that you'd love to work with um, in your sort of ideal scenario of kind of any collaborator, any, any project? Is there anything that you would um, love to do? Um, I'm kind of trying to read the body language here to see who to ask um, uh, first. I'm gonna go for Emma first, if that's okay. <laughs> I, I'm just giggling because it, um, the idea of getting a million quid to do whatever I want with for three to four years sounds like such fantasy land, <laughs> a lovely fantasy land. Um, well, I've actually got, I've got a grant um, under review at the moment. And so maybe if I, if I say what I want to do for that grant, that will um, put into the universe um, my, my desire for it and I'll get some, some positive news sometime soon. And um, so the current grant that I've got is kind of building on the ideas of engaging with immersivity that I'm doing with Punch Drunk, the, the one that's under review at the moment. And I'm hoping to try and commission some work through the Pervasive Media Studio as part of that grant um, to work on a kind of mixed reality um, project. So moving for me into a very different format, I've primarily worked um, on more traditional theatrical projects. Um, but given that I've started engaging with ideas of immersivity with Punch Drunk to try and build upon that and look at the potential of ancient literature in different forms of immersion. Um, because the ancients were very interested in ideas of immersion, particularly through narrative, how um, 
we could read a narrative which would make us feel as if we were witnessing the narrative, as if it was coming to life in front of our eyes. Um, and I think there's no, um, it's no coincidence that there are a lot of immersive experiences today which look back to antiquity, whether that's kind of immersive museum experiences related to the ancient city of Pergamon, um, immersive games like Assassin's Creed Odyssey or kind of theatrical experiences like Punch Drunk's Kabeiroi. So I'm hoping to try and move that into a different platform. So that would be my, my ideal thing, which could very well happen. We'll wait and see, hopefully I'll know soon. Right, like, um, we hope it does. Um, and it might be something I think that Kate and Angie would be really interested <laughs> in exploring as well. Um, Kate, what would you want to do? Like, is, uh, is there anyone that you'd kind of love to work with, a project you'd love to work with? Um, well, the pro I guess, I guess it, it kind of, it, it takes forward what I've been, what I've been thinking about for a long, for a long time now, really, which is, you know, as we see, the, as the right, with the rise of visual media, and the rise of immersive and, and um, online environments. What, what is the future of, of text? What is the future of reading? And, 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 and of course, the future, the future of writing. I mean, on a, on a kind of more basic level, I'd really like to, to start working on some um, text-based projects that use augmented reality, because I think that, um, I think that we're very accustomed to reading on our phones now. And the, and the combination of text and your camera, there's all kinds of interesting possibilities there. Um, and that, so on a kind of micro level, that is really what I'd like to, to, to be working on next. But in a larger sense with a million pounds, it, it would really would be about what is the future of text? What is a reader in 20 years time going to be reading? I mean, I have no doubt we'll still be reading books, but I, but I mean in, in a more digitally mediated um, environment. Great. Sounds like another great project. Angie, what, what about you? Um, I mean, I know you've got a huge project coming up um, <laughs> with the dragons and then one that comes after that. Um, if we could go forward to the, 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 the third project in a row, and you're also working on a project at the moment um, with the Bristol and Bath R&D cluster. Um, is there anything else in maybe the, the sort of three years horizon, I guess, for Angie and Trigger? <laughs> It's, it's, it, it spans over all projects, whether it's a new one or not, but I've been thinking a lot about um, nationalism and patriotism and what, um, what is British and, and those two things that I just said are such dirty words and they, you, you immediately think right wing and you immediately think uh, racist. But actually, how can we be patriotic? How can we have national pride and have healthy national pride and bring everybody and everybody's voice along with that? And I've been thinking about the fact that if you as a person hate yourself and you don't like, um, you've, you've got a damaged relationship um, with, with your self-identity, then you find it very difficult to have healthy relationships with other people, with your own family and friends. And if we think of Britain as that person who is self-hating, slightly can't look at their own past, you know, icky history, um, climate paralysis, um, north and south, devolving divides, cast itself off <laughs> as an island to live solo. Um, is there a way that we can, I mean, as a, as the as strongest provocation, can we, can we um, wave that flag proudly because we're proud of what we're behind doesn't help that we've got um who we've got in government but putting that aside i am interested in national identity and how um people from, from all cultures can be part of that great wow fantastic angie we should talk about that <laughs> offline because i'm interested in that as well um but we should move to some questions um shouldn't we there's a really great question come in um about what um what's a good outcome do you think for these kinds of projects um, that bring academics and creatives together? And I guess it's maybe what's a good outcome for the project, but also for each individual. And um, Emma, I don't know if you want to start with that um, about, you know, cause you talked a bit about process and product. What do, you, what do you feel like is a good outcome for you? And is that shared with your collaborators? Um, what, what, does, what does good mean in this kind of work? For me, good means that we want to work together again. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, something is seen through to its intended conclusion. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have reams of audience surveys that I can 
take back to show evidence of reach and impact. Um, it means that we we both thought that we got something out of the collaboration and there's a desire to explore that further in a new format. Um, I suppose the difficulty with that is um, being a classicist, I have a very specific set of expertise that I can contribute. And so uh, a creative might not necessarily see their work as engaging with the ancient world again in the next project. But even if it doesn't actually happen, if there's that desire and that interest in, you know, in a ideal scenario, if both of our work patterns um, reach a point where we're in, again engaging with similar questions or similar sets of texts, we would turn to each other again. I think that's a, an ideal end point for the relationship. Not end point, an, I, an ideal finish. What, what's the word I'm looking for? Goal for the relationship. Um, Angie, would you echo that? That as a, is, is that is that what a good outcome looks like for you when you've worked with academics, or is there anything else you'd you'd kind of add in? Yeah, I think um, the outcome is to have an impact on one another's process, for something to have changed for one or the other of you in that process. Kate, I guess I'd just add that I think for me it's always it's always rewarding when the research produces something that people outside of the research want to engage with whether that's an academic output or a creative output um, that that there's there's something there's something there for the world um, and i think that's important in terms of also when we're talking about public public money publicly funded projects um, the second question is a question of sort of money question um, and in particular i guess It'd be interesting to have your broader reflections on your own kind of position within your relative worlds um, because the question is specifically about is there any advice for people who are just really starting out on this so in particular academics who don't yet have a full-time post like emma you do or kate you do um, and also uh, who are really early stage artists say compared to you angie who's much further along in your career and have got a really strong portfolio of work you know if you're kind of just right at the beginning of an academic or an artistic career have you got any thoughts about where to go to try and start working in these kinds of ways which are bridging the academy and the and, and the artistic world i think find find a network you know find find people in your city or your region who are doing things that you think are are interesting and and um go along to to um their their public events and uh i think um i think it's hard uh you know and, and it's probably going to get harder over the next couple of years as as the economy tanks and you know uh universities are under increasing increasing pressure at, etc um, so it's not easy but I think it I think it really is again about just finding finding people finding people who who you can talk to collaborate with and and learn from I would say you know find your question um, because it, it's taken six years for me to to make the hatchling um, and even two years ago you would have seen me in the you know on my own as an artist and now I've got a company so I've done a lot of the work by going directly to academics seeing if they want a coffee talking about the project before I've had any funding I know it's easy to say that and it's you know I'm not um, trying to sweep anyone's financial problems under the carpet but academics are open and they are interested in interesting conversations um, because once you can make that link with an academic um, and develop your project then you're in much stronger position to go for the funding so don't think you need the funding first and you need the venues in place and then once you develop that idea you know for, for a long time I was working freelance four days a week and trying to cram everything else into the one day a week which I'd call my dream project time before I, I could um, you know ch change the balance so I, I wouldn't wait until you think you're experienced enough and um, go out and be exploratory and, and try and get that experience by starting a conversation because because essentially the academic and artist relationship is the cheapest one you know not trying to get the do down um, academics paid time but it is the thing that you can do over coffee it's the getting the artists in the room and making the work happen that's really expensive so uh, a cup of coffee goes a long way <laughs> <laughs> in terms of talking to academics. Emma, do you have any thoughts for um, 
for someone who um, is just starting out in an academic career, I don't know your PhD students say, um, or you know, really early career researchers, is, are there any thoughts for how they could dip the toes in the water like Andrew suggested for those who are artists? Yeah, it's definitely not easy, but um, I would say that a conversation costs nothing. And um, again, not to sweep anyone's financial circumstances under the carpet, but um, if, if someone reaches out to you, um, and even if they don't have a budget and you're a PhD student, I would engage in the conversation because you don't know where it could go. Um, and there are lots of small pots of money available, which don't add up to being enough generally to finance a big project, a, a large scale production or something, but there are lots, um, particularly in the humanities at the moment, um, lots of little pots of money here and there for engaging with different communities. Um, and so I would say speak to your mentors, your advisors, supervisors and whatnot about what might be out there. Um, things like the Being Human Festival, if you've got an idea, you can get, I think that might be up to £2,000. Um, and you can do something like a, a staged reading if you're interested in engaging with theatrical collaborators. So you could, um, you know, finance for a series of workshops and then the money could go to paying for people's time for the workshops leading up to a staged reading that you could just put on in your university and your supervisor could try and get you some space free of charge to do the staged reading. So the money could go to supporting the development. Um, at Bristol, we've got something called the Institute of Greece, Rome and the Classical Tradition, which again offers um, small grants, small pots of money for projects which are linked to the ancient world. Um, and it regularly funds, you know, um, projects which are engaging with artists and um, trying to brainstorm ideas and develop projects. So um, don't be afraid of embarking upon conversations um, and ask for help because there, there are small pots of money and sometimes you only need a little bit and then you've got a track record behind the project showing that you've been able to, to get some funding and that can lead to bigger things. Um, so start small and see where it leads. Great, fantastic. I think we've got time for a couple more um, questions. Um, so I'm going to take uh, a couple of questions first um, from Lucy. Um, that um, one specifically for you, Emma. So I can maybe just start with that one. Um, that you, um, but it, it's one that that maybe is answered more broadly. You mentioned this kind of um, sense that process and product are valued differently, potentially. Um, and the question is really, what do you think that tension can um, tell us about the way we understand um, different approaches to knowledge um, or the production of knowledge or maybe um, research? Um, and um, so that's kind of the first question from Lucy is just, is there anything there about this kind of process product that might be interesting to, to explore? And, and we'll do a quick once round if you want to answer that. And or um, Angie mentioned this idea of um, she, uh, that Lucy really liked of, of um, artists kind of breaking out of their echo chambers. Do you feel like that works the other way around as well? Can artists in a sense bring academics out of their, their echo chambers? And then I'm gonna ask a question from Max just after that, but maybe respond to that. Anything about that kind of process product that helps us think about different ideas of knowledge and, and any sense of, of the idea of echo chambers being burst? I, I know this is being recorded, so I feel like I should be careful about what I say in response to that question. Um, I suppose this is one area where um, not being in a, a fixed academic position actually liberates you a little bit um, in terms of um, giving you the capacity potentially to engage in process which doesn't have an end product. Um, but I suppose the reality of um, being in an academic post is that you, you have to be accountable for your time and there are, are workload models and um, you're expected in yearly reviews to be able to, to show what you've achieved and often those achievements have to have to be in a sense tangible so um, your line managers um, for purposes like the, the research excellence framework are, are looking for outputs that will be able to be submitted so there are a wider forces at play in terms of um, the economics behind higher education which um, mean that despite the the goodwill of individuals um, that there are there are demands for something tangible to show um, for your work um, and I don't think that means that there's not a valuing of process by individuals and at a local level 
but there are wider realities at play and it's about trying to, to find um, formats within that wider framework um, where you can engage in those more open-ended collaborations. Um, and so trying to couple an output which documents a process with um, a research with a research project that might not result in an artistic product. Um, so doing um, a rehearsal study for me, that somewhat liberates me a little bit from the impact of the final artistic product and um, the reviews and the number of audiences who come because I am going to be um, creating some type of output which is all about the process. Um, so there are there are ways of I think making um, making process be valued within the framework in which academics are working in. Um, but there there is at the moment because of the forces that govern higher education, I think a, a bit of a requirement to have some type of product at the end as well. Um, maybe okay, can I turn to you and just bring in Max's question here? Because Max um, refers to um, something that I hadn't heard of actually called the Hidden Ref that aims to recognise research outputs outside of traditional academic publishing. And he points, Max, there to this, this kind of challenges that Emma talks about, about the research excellence framework and these bigger contexts within which academics work. How does that play out, do you think, in your own work around this kind of sense of process product? Do you feel a kind of um, a sense within the academic community of a, an almost an obsession with product because of the research assessment framework or are there opportunities to work around that? Um, well, um, I guess I've witnessed a couple of ref, ref cycles now uh, and I've gone from being completely baffled by it to to understanding it a bit a bit, a bit better and for non-academics this is the research excellence framework exercise that the government asks us to do every seven years uh, and I, I, it, the ref has absolutely really changed the way it, it, it looks at um, creative, creative practice outputs now. And it's possible to, to really push the, push the boundaries on the kinds of things that will now be considered as research uh, from a ceramic pot to, to, a, to a ghost story for the smartphone. So, um, so you know, that's a good thing. But I think uh, I think part of what Max is talking about is, is, you know, this, our world's obsession with metrics. And again, that's a thing that's not going to go away. And we need to, we need to think about, think of, you know, and, and also that is one good thing that the universities are good at, which I referred to earlier, which is, you know, uh, longitudinal looks at things. And, uh, you know, one of the things I find most puzzling is the idea that you can measure culture, that you, that there's a metric that you can value culture by. Um, but at the same time, this is being imposed on us from, from above. And it's, so we have to find creative and interesting ways, ways to deal with it. Um, as, as much as I personally would love to just reject it and say, no, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Uh, I think the, rea the financial reality is that, is that you have to. So um, yeah, it's a really interesting question, Max, and, and, uh, and a, a really, uh, deserves a really complicated answer that I can't quite muster right now. Um, Angie, maybe I could just finish with you because one thing that strikes me is I, from knowing your work, I feel like process is incredibly important for you um, and not just product, but I wonder if you could re think, reflect on that, that sense of the relationship between process and product um, within your own work. And I wonder here if academics and artists, you know, in, in some ways as you've already been suggesting, I think, or maybe closer, because actually process matters to both of us. Um, although we both operate within economic realities where we also have to deliver products, either for the Arts Council or for um, our, 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 our line managers within universities or for funders or for the, the research excellence framework, which Kate said a bit more about. Yeah, I mean, I love research and development. If I could just live in research development where anything's possible and it could be amazing. For me, as soon as we get into the rehearsal room and it starts becoming a reality, I'm zipping off to have a new idea with someone else and, and for academics to be right there on day one of that research and development is um, really important. When I've seen academics been brought into the rehearsal room for a traditional piece of theatre, by then it feels a bit too late, it feels like they might be able to have an impact on a line or, or two but not really centrally to the kernel of the idea. Um, so yeah, R&D um, and oh, pros, uh, product. 
I, I then think, it, for me, it's great when we just trust each other to, to create the product. So um, we'll create the show out of our synergies and you'll do what academics do, which is always a bit um, of a, <laughs> um, never really know what quite that is. I'm always interested to see what it is later. And uh, yeah, just to trust that those, those things will come out separately rather than have to co-write a thing or make a video where we both, you know, because that's an extra workload that usually doesn't service us or the academics. That always feels like an extra milestone of pressure that we, do, we both don't need for our work. Uh, th that's really nice, a nice place to end this in some ways is about that kind of shared, like you said, that rather than bringing people in right at the end of the day when it's too late, bring people in at the beginning, that there's this kind of shared process, but then actually trusting each other with the products um, that uh, is a really nice way to think about that. Um, thanks so much to all three of you. And maybe Kate, um, would you mind just giving us a quick intro, a, a sort of brief sense of what the next conversation is? Because I know you'll be leading on the next conversation, which will be taking place um, next month. So I think it's on Wednesday, the 26th of May. Um, same time, same place, um, the virtual world of um, Zoom webinar. But maybe, Kate, could you tell us a little bit about what that'll involve? Well, this converse, the next conversation will, will come up out of the Amplified Publishing Project. Uh, and I, I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk about um, how consumers find content they'd normally never find, uh, and conversely, how creators can find their audiences. Perfect. So um, uh, same time, same place in a, a, a month's time or so to join Kate for that. Thanks so much, Kate, and thanks, Emma, and thanks, Angie. Thanks all of you for, for joining us and for the great questions um, and the equally great answers. Bye Thank now. You, Jim.